I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we continue our discussion of week two in the prosecution's case against Derek Chauvin. Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, with my alluring colleague, Alice. Thank you, Brett. I don't know that's actually true, but <laughs> thank you. Well, Jane thought you were alluring, oh, so we're going you, with Jane. alluring today. I'm very thankful to all the listeners who are providing me with descriptors for Alice because I've really just run out of words to describe her. I don't think you've ever run out of words in your life. <laughs> well, that's probably also true, so maybe I can't. Well, nevertheless, I appreciate how involved the listeners are in this very important aspect of our podcast. So thank you to all of you who are sending in descriptors for Alice. Keep doing that. Yes, please help Brett do research on words. <laughs> Brett needs all the help he can get when it comes to words. People in the gallery, which is the Facebook group that I guess you can say supports our podcast, but they're constantly making fun of me in the way I pronounce things. And I just don't know. I feel like uh, they feel like love a hostility you. here. They love you so much. The gallery is an awesome Facebook group. Y'all should check out, by the way. See, Alice likes when they make fun of me, but whatever. <laughs> Well, Alice, we are back today to continue our discussion of the Derek Chauvin trial, the death of George Floyd. Thank you to everyone who's reached out to us with questions and comments as we continue to to do this semi-live coverage of this trial. Podcasting is not really the perfect medium for this kind of thing, but we're doing the best we can, and I hope you guys are enjoying it. One question as we dive in today, that we've gotten several times is why is it that George Floyd's drug use is coming in and sort of constantly discussed in this trial, but Derek Chauvin's previous uses of force have not come in? For those of you who don't know, there was a motion in Lemony early on. Uh, the prosecution wanted to use some of Derek Chauvin's previous uses of force against him in this trial, and the judge excluded those. Excluded those on 404 grounds, excluded those as improper character, evidence. So none of that's coming in. None of Chauvin's prior uses of force are going to come in in this case. But we have heard a lot about George Floyd's drug use. And a lot of people have asked, why is that? Alice, do you want to take a shot at that? Well, Brett, that's, that is a very good question, but these are actually two different things we're talking about here. George Floyd's drug use is um, coming in because the defense is alleging that his drug use actually is the cause of his death, not Chauvin's actions with the placement of his knee. And so they're actually talking about his drug use that day, and they're limiting it to just that day. They're not talking about his history of drug use and any past convictions he may or may not have had with respect to... Um, drug use, possession, or really any convictions. Because remember, the purpose of this information is not to go to show George Floyd's character. It's to go to the specific events of that day. Did his heart stop because of the fentanyl or because of what Chauvin's actions did with respect to asphyxiation or some other cause that the prosecution may be pushing? And along the lines of what Alice is saying, if the defense tried to just bring in a bunch of prior bad acts of George Floyd, prior drug use, the fact that, you know, in 2008, he got high on cocaine. In 2010, he, he was using methamphetamine. If they were trying to do that, none of that would actually come in. That's all character evidence. It's improper and you can't use it. 
as we've said before, when you're when you're bringing this other evidence in, it has to be tied into the events that are at issue at trial. So even though I understand the notion of, you know, Chauvin's on trial, not George Floyd, why are we talking about what George Floyd was doing? Obviously, what George Floyd was doing that day has some impact on whether or not what Chauvin did was reasonable. I think a good example of this, you know, during this trial, there was an officer involved shooting in Tennessee, I think in Nashville or Knoxville, I can't remember exactly where it was, and an officer killed another person. Now, you could say, well, all that matters is that officer killed that other person. It doesn't matter what that other person was doing. They're not on trial. The officer's on trial. Well, the other person had brought a gun to a school, presumably to shoot people in the school, and the officer killed them before they could do that. I think we all agree that that is a legitimate use of force. That was an officer who acted appropriately. But the only way you know that is if you take into consideration both what the other person was doing and what the officer is doing. So while I know people find it distasteful that we're talking about Floyd and talking about what he was doing that day, and it seems like we're demonizing him, that is just simply part of this case, and it's something that can't be avoided. The other side of this is why didn't Chauvin's prior uses of force come in? And we talked about this before. This is a very human reaction to the rules of evidence. There is a feeling of we should hear everything about this person's past because it informs what they were doing that day. If Chauvin improperly used force before, he would improperly use force this day, and that should be important. And that's not how the rules of evidence work. The rules say that unless it is directly tied to this incident, it's not going to come in. You really would have to come up with some way that a prior use of force was was involved here. So imagine, for instance, that he'd had a previous run-in with Mr. Floyd and had improperly used force against him then. Maybe it comes in then because they have bad blood between them. And think of it from the other side. Imagine that Chauvin had 10 prior uses of force. And in those 10 prior uses of force, he was found it was legitimate legitimate uses of force. Everybody agreed. He perfectly followed the rules. He made no mistakes. He got awards from civic organizations for proper use of force and not abusing his power. Imagine all of that was true. Should any of that come into this trial? Does any of that have any bearing on whether or not what he did to George Floyd that day was excessive? And I think everybody would agree, no, it doesn't. It doesn't matter how awesome and wonderful he's been in the past if him kneeling on George Floyd's neck for nine minutes killed George Floyd and violated every rule and everything a reasonable officer would do, then we don't care about how amazing he's been in the past. And it's sort of the same thing here. If what he did that day was perfect and perfectly compliant and right in line with everything that police standard says, and didn't kill George Floyd, it doesn't actually matter that in the past he's had some sort of negative run-in. So that's sort of the idea behind it. We really want the jury making a decision based on that day and based on his actions that day and that interaction with George Floyd, not the good things he's done in the past and not the bad things he's done in the past. So that's one reason that none of that other stuff came in. And if this seems at core unfair. Uh, we had this exact discussion in the Temujin Kensu episode about um, how you can't look to past acts to prove the particular charge in front of you. An appellate court judge actually wrote a concurrence explaining the very thing that this rule is supposed to protect against. You don't want the jurors to think he's done bad acts in the past, so therefore he must have done it now. Or he may not have done the bad act here, but because he's done enough bad acts in the past, we should hold him accountable now and feel just fine about convicting him because he did something bad enough in the past to justify this. That's not how our justice system works. That's not how due process works. Yeah, and hopefully hopefully that explains some of that. If you guys do have questions about that, let us know. I mean, look, I've seen the memes on Twitter. It's a very easy thing to do. You know, George Floyd's not on trial. Chauvin's on trial. Why are we talking more about Chauvin? Totally understand that feeling, but there is a good reason why the system's set up the way it is. 
So having said that, let's turn back to the witnesses. Told you yesterday, I felt like the defense sort of had its high water mark uh, in the very sort of first couple days of the second week of trial. I thought they had really hit their stride and they were making a lot of good points. And then the prosecution called Dr. Martin Tobin to the stand. Dr. Tobin was a very engaging and interesting witness. He's Irish. He has sort of a slight Irish accent. I recommend everybody go and listen to his testimony, and you can listen to it at 1.75 or two times speed, and it's just fine because he talks so slowly. If you listen to it on that speed, it seems perfectly normal. So not only you know can you listen to it quickly, but you can understand everything he's saying, and he's he's worth it. Now remember, the state autopsy indicated a heart attack, and and I had mentioned in the openings I didn't really understand why they were saying this is really about oxygen deprivation. Well, Dr. Tobin is the big gun that the prosecution has brought in to show, no, this was oxygen deprivation. He is a world-renowned pulmonologist. He is the author of a 1,500-page textbook, Principles and Practice of Mechanical Ventilation, that is the Bible of this subject, the foremost authority on the subject. And Tobin is actually testifying pro bono because he thought he had some expertise here. He's never testified before as an expert. This is his first time. And there's actually a couple times where it's very endearing because he doesn't know how to testify. And the, the prosecution will say, you know, what do you see in front of you? And the only reason is he's supposed to say, this is a diagram of X. So the prosecution can then say, Your Honor, we moved to introduce such and such. And he never does that. He just starts talking about what's in the diagram and they always have to stop him. And it's, it's like I said, to me at least, it's endearing as a somebody who's dealt with this before, that he doesn't really know what he's doing. And honestly, it gives him a little bit more heft. This is not a professional expert. This is just an expert who felt like he had something to offer. And I think it is not overstatement to say that Tobin's testimony is perhaps the most important in the trial. Tobin testifies that Floyd died of lack of oxygen caused by shallow breaths that weren't able to provide the amount of oxygen necessary for him to survive. Tobin explained that the combination of him being on the ground, handcuffed behind his back, with a knee on his back, created the perfect storm for Floyd not to be able to breathe. It was so bad that the doctor compared it to a surgeon having gone in and simply removed one of his lungs. The doctor testified that the hypopharynx, normally the size of a dime, which is where oxygen and air passes through on its way to the lungs, would have been shrunk to the size of a straw. Tobin noted in his testimony that just being in the prone position, so just being face down on your stomach, would significantly decrease Floyd's oxygen levels by as much as 25%. Prone with the combination of a knee led to a 43% reduction. Tobin then walks through how Chauvin's body was erect, and at points, none of his shoe was even touching the ground, meaning that half his body weight was coming down on Floyd's neck, approximately 91 and a half pounds. Tobin also testified that the particular location of Chauvin's knee really didn't matter. Having the force of the back and the force of the street on the front was enough. And this is important because remember, the defense repeatedly has been showing different images to different witnesses where Chauvin's knee is not on the neck like it is in the famous photos that we've seen with his hands in his pockets and the famous video. And in fact, sometimes it's on the shoulder, sometimes it's on the back. And this is a really important point that Tobin's making because basically he's saying it doesn't matter. Another thing he does during this period, which is interesting and may refute future testimony by the defense, it's not entirely clear. There's something called, uh, he says it's from San Diego. There's like a San Diego school of thought where these people in San Diego have done these tests to show that being in the prone position with weight on your back does not cause asphyxiation. And Tobin goes through and just demolishes these people, it just point by point in these very common sense ways explains how their experiments just don't work. It kind of reminded me, frankly, of the testimony, the Dwayne Deaver testimony uh, 
in the staircase where Dwayne Deaver is saying all this stuff and in sort of making up these experiments that don't work. And Tobin just so effectively goes in and demolishes that. So if the defense was ever planning to call those people, it's, it's, they are already debunked before they even take the stand. And that's a terrible feeling um, when you know you have witnesses lined up who, before they even testify, have been debunked. So I, I don't know if that's what the defense had planned, but that was um, a lot of foresight for the prosecution uh, to have a Tobin testify about this. Now, Tobin is able to state that he can tell when Floyd receives a brain injury in the video because it is at this point that Floyd extends his leg in a way that is something clinicians look for when looking for brain damage. It's something called a hypoxic seizure. It is an example of the brain responding to a lack of oxygen. In fact, Tobin purported to state the exact moment when Floyd died, quote, the moment the life went out of his body, 8, 24, and 55 seconds. The knee remained on his neck for another 3 minutes and 30 seconds, and the knee remained on his neck after the officers found no pulse for another 2 minutes. And this is another amazing, I've never seen anything like this, because you have this expert you know, he's looking at these videos, and it's it's interesting. I've seen a lot of commentary that was like, if there had been no videos, how would this case be different? Would it have ever been charged? I don't know whether it ever would have been charged, but you wouldn't have had a moment like this. Because there's so much video, he is able, as a clinician, to look at George Floyd and explain to us exactly what is happening to him. And this moment where he shows George Floyd's leg, it, it, it it's really weird. I, you may have noticed it before, you may have not, but basically he sort of kicks straight up backwards and it doesn't really make any sense and it's not in reaction to anything and it seems like like a jerky movement. And this is something that clinicians look for and is indicative of brain damage because of a lack of oxygen. And he's able to point out exactly when it happens. And then in this moment that just was mind-blowing to me and I think must have been mind-blowing to the jury, he... They are playing this video in slow motion that the young lady took that's become so famous. And he literally says there's a moment where George Floyd's eyes flutter. And he says, like, that's the last moment of his life. And that after that, he, as he says, that is the moment the life went out of his body. And as Alice pointed out, this happens a full three minutes and a half before the knees even taken off of George Floyd's neck. And after that, he noted when they noticed that they don't have a pulse. And once again, the knee remains on George Floyd's neck for another two minutes. And this is really powerful for a couple reasons. Obviously, it's powerful because it goes to this notion that George Floyd died of oxygen deprivation, a notion that I was skeptical of when we started on this. I thought, look, your coroner says heart attack, go with heart attack. Well, after hearing this testimony, I understand completely why the prosecution went for this, but it does something else too. And it's something the prosecution does not explicitly state, but I think the jury is smart enough to understand. Remember, it's not just about whether or not Chauvin killed Floyd. It's about whether or not the actions he was taking were reasonable in light of the circumstances. According to Tobin, Floyd's essentially been dead for three minutes and Chauvin never moves. You know, what is the danger at that point? What's the danger for the two minutes when Floyd doesn't even have a pulse? And I've got to think the, the jury is thinking that, and I've got to think that is something that the prosecution is going to highlight in closing argument. Yeah. That level of specificity, it, you know, it's really hard to find an expert who will testify to that level of specificity in any type of case, um, much less a, a, a murder trial. So Tobin is scoring some huge points for the prosecution here. To further cut against what the defense has been trying to put forth about pre-existing drug use or pre-existing conditions for Floyd, Tobin testified that any pre-existing conditions just didn't matter a healthy person would have died. And he also speaks to the fentanyl 
fentanyl decreases the rate of respiration. That's how it decreases the amount of oxygen. But Floyd's respiration rate does not decrease, is what he testifies to. He is trying to breathe, but isn't getting any oxygen. So this is really just shooting an arrow through the heart of the theory that it's the fentanyl that's causing him not to have enough oxygen. He's saying his respiratory rate is not decreasing. That is not the point. It's that he can't get air. and He can't get air because of the compression of the pavement in front of him and the weight of 91 and a half pounds of Chauvin's body on his back, pressing together to shrink his airway to the size of a straw. And this is another one of those moments where the video is so powerful because they pull up a video and he counts the number of respirations that Floyd has. And it's a, it's, it's on to, on the dot, the standard number of respirations you would expect for someone his age. So Floyd is taking the number of breaths you would expect. He's just not able to take much breath because of the position that he's in. Fentanyl, he should be taking half as many breaths. His respiratory rate should be slowing down. And that's just not what you're seeing here. It is really hard to overstate how powerful this testimony is. And whereas in prior witnesses, the defense had come in on cross-examination and done a very good job of poking holes, they're just not able to do that here. And I just got to tell you, you know, we got a comment after our last video that we were taking the side of the prosecution and we were obviously on the prosecution side, which is not true. But however you feel about this case, whether you've watched any of this case or not, take the time to watch Tobin's testimony. Just take the time to do it. If you watch nothing else, just watch this testimony. And I think if you do that, you can form your own opinion about what happened here. And honestly, I think if you just listen to Tobin's testimony, you're going to get sort of the full breadth of the prosecution's case, whether or not that's a case you believe or not. Obviously, Tobin was not the last person to testify. He was followed by Daniel Eisensmith, who was a toxicologist. And, you know, this is an interesting case because so much of the prosecution's case is a pre-rebuttal of what the defense is saying and is going to say. The facts are sort of clear, right? I mean, there's no question that George Floyd was on that street that day and that so was Chauvin and they had a direct interaction with each other and Floyd ended up dead. So, so much of it is just telling the story and then reinforcing the story and rebutting the story the defense is going to make. And in this case, Eisen Smith is the person who did a test of uh, George Floyd's blood. This testimony was much more equivocal than the last one. It was interesting. And that test found that... George Floyd's blood contained 11 nanograms per milligram of fentanyl and a metabolite of fentanyl of 5.6 nanograms per milliliter, as well as 19 nanograms per milliliter of methamphetamine. So there's no question Floyd was doing drugs that day. He was doing fentanyl that day. He was doing methamphetamine that day. Now, the interesting thing about the meth, these numbers probably don't mean anything to you. So I'm going to give you some context. 19 nanograms per milligram. Remember, we talked about that pill and how it was only 3% methamphetamine. In the old days, sort of your the meth labs you think of out in the country, it was about 30% methamphetamine. That was a purity level they could reach. We now have these things called super labs, most of them coming out of Mexico. And methamphetamine is like 95 to 100% pure methamphetamine, which is one reason it's so dangerous these days. Well, the methamphetamine that Floyd had was very low like less than 5% pure methamphetamine. And that's about what you would expect if a person took a single dose of prescription methamphetamine. Yes, it exists. Apparently people take it for narcolepsy. Who knew? This is something I learned in this trial, which is a very low level of methamphetamine. Now, the fentanyl is a different story. Number one, the fact there was metabolite indicated that this probably wasn't an overdose because overdoses tend to happen so quickly that the body can't even begin to break down fentanyl. 
So the fact that the body was able to break it down indicates that this was not an overdose. Nevertheless, it's, the numbers are still interesting. On cross-examination, the defense was able to bring out that compared to other fentanyl overdoses, so the typical fentanyl overdose, the mean concentration is about 16.8 nanograms per milliliter. So that's the average. So if you averaged all the fentanyl overdoses together, the average is 16.8 nanograms. Now that is significantly more than what was in Floyd's blood, 11 nanograms. But I think for overdoses, your median is probably a better number because some people overdose at such massive levels that it really skews the numbers. And so the median, those of you who remember math class that take us back to our worst class that we all hated, the median's the number in the middle. It's not the average, it's the number in the middle. And the median was 10. So that's less than what George Floyd had. So if you took all the overdoses and laid them out on a line, the one in the middle is 10, George Floyd would be past that as far as the amount of fentanyl he had in his blood. And you can compare this to living people who are suspected of using fentanyl, usually in DUI cases. The mean there, so the average, is 9.5, and the median is 5.3. So that's about half of where George Floyd was. And Eisenstadt testified that about 25% of living suspects, so those who have a DUI, have, have Floyd's level or higher of fentanyl. And that because of that, Floyd is still closer to a living suspect as far as his fentanyl level than someone who's died. What do we learn from this? We learn that it's possible that the amount of fentanyl that Floyd had in his body could have killed him. We also learn that it's perfectly possible that he could have survived. And this is a place where Floyd's drug use actually helps the prosecution. The fact that Floyd had used drugs before and had used drugs quite a bit means he has a pretty high tolerance. If I took this much fentanyl, I would die. Never took fentanyl before, but George Floyd had. So in a way, even though that bothered people before, it actually helps the prosecution on this point. Yeah, that was a very technical expert. But as you can see, there, there's multiple angles even to interpret this data. And so that was effective cross-examination to show kind of the different medians and averages that are there and to put properly place George Floyd in the category that the defense is trying to put him in, right? He was clearly living, but also uh, clearly living before he was taken to the ground, uh, but had taken the fentanyl. And so it kind of begins to leave that bigger hole of a question of on which of these spectrums does he lie? A spectrum that I don't think the defense was able to create in terms of Tobin's testimony. Now, Dr. William Smock testified as a doctor in forensics. He was asked whether Floyd could be experiencing excited delirium, as the defense had alluded to at times. He said that out of 10 signs of this condition, Floyd had zero. Again, Dr. Smock's testimony here is like is a pre-rebuttal to the defense's case. Now, Dr. Smock also testified that the amount of fentanyl in Floyd's blood was not near the amount necessary for an overdose, and that he showed no signs of suffering from an overdose. This was a point where the prosecution used Floyd's drug use in their favor because, like Brett mentioned, of his history of drug use, he would have had he would have built up a tolerance to the drugs he was taking. Now, one thing I want to mention here that I want you to remember as we get into the defense case, one of the symptoms of fentanyl is essentially narcolepsy. So you just fall asleep. Obviously, Floyd was not asleep when he was engaged with the police, but the defense is going to bring this up again. So just hold that in your mind for when we get into the defense case later. Now, on the last day of the week, the prosecution began with Dr. Lindsay Thomas a forensic pathologist. Dr. Thomas testified that Floyd died of asphyxia and that there was no evidence that but for Floyd's interaction with law enforcement, he would have died. Now, this is very interesting. This is another one of their experts who is countering what the state coroner said was the cause of death. Now, perhaps the most interesting thing about Dr. Thomas is that she trained Dr. Andrew Baker, the forensic pathologist who concluded that Floyd died of cardiac arrest. 
Baker would testify next. This is very interesting placing, right? So you got Baker, who's kind of your weakest part of your case, and he's got to testify. You can't hide him. He has to testify. And so what do they do? They put the person who trained him first. And the person who trained him testifies, this is what happened, not what this other guy says. And the other guy is somebody she trained and is the person who is going to testify next. That is a really strategic placement of witnesses. This is a type of, you know, chess playing with your witnesses that you don't typically see happening. And I'll just say, whatever you think about this case, whoever you think's guilty or innocent or whatever, I do think the prosecution has done a fantastic job. The, the way they've set this case up, the way they've arranged these witnesses, the way they've told the story is really great. If, if this case weren't so emotional for so many people, I would say everybody should watch it as an example of the way a prosecution should go. I think this prosecution team, win or lose, has really done as well as they could have. I mean, the story they put together, I think, is probably the best story they could have put together, and this is just another example of them doing that. So they call Baker to the stand, and and Baker's testimony is sort of interesting. Number one, it's a very short direct. It's You would expect a much longer direct of Baker if Baker was more in line with what the prosecution wants him to say, but they nevertheless get him to say generally the things that you want to hear. Number one, he does testify that Floyd's death was not natural, nor was it due to a drug overdose, both of which are good for the defense who's been trying to argue that a combination of Floyd's heart condition and drug use is what actually killed him. Baker testifies that this death was a homicide. Now, this is something that I want to point out because I see this all the time. Medical examiners are not lawyers. When they say a death is a homicide, it is a medical term, not a legal term. All it means is that the actions of other people were involved in the death. So it doesn't mean homicide like we think of when we think of criminal cases where it's a homicide. That means someone murdered somebody. So when he writes homicide on the death certificate, it is not, you know, Derek Chauvin murdered him and now needs to go be convicted. That's my professional medical opinion. It does not imply criminal culpability. Just something to remember. You see this a lot. And basically, every case, there'll be some tweet where it's like, medical examiner says homicide, responsible for death. And it's really it's really clickbait. Now, Baker did say, this is a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag for the prosecution. He did say they were contributing factors to Floyd's death. So remember... He says, this wasn't the result of natural causes. It wasn't the result of a drug overdose. But when he's saying that, he means the primary cause was not that. There are secondary causes. He says that Floyd did have fairly serious heart disease. In fact, I believe one of his arteries was about 90% blocked. And his heart was enlarged. Baker said that Because of these factors and due to law enforcement actions, it was, quote, just more than Mr. Floyd could take. So he's sort of saying it's it's it took both in his view. Now, this is different note from what we heard from Dr. Tobin. Dr. Tobin said a perfectly healthy person would have died because of what Chauvin did. Now we have a later prosecution witness who's saying it was a combination of both. And you can see how that's valuable for the defense and not entirely what the prosecution wants to hear. Baker did say that fentanyl didn't cause the death, nor did heart disease. He says the primary cause of death was the neck restraint that Floyd had used. And Baker also acknowledged that he was not a pulmonologist. He had no expertise in that. So this sort of bolsters Tobin's testimony because Tobin knows what he's talking about when it comes to this. And Baker's saying, look, that's just not something... I know that much about. So the direct examination here probably lasted 30 minutes, if that. The defense cross was probably three, four times that. And on cross, the defense really did focus on Mr. Floyd's heart. They got Baker to say that Floyd's heart was much larger than normal, likely due to high blood pressure. His arteries were narrow. They were partially blocked. And the defense was able to get him to acknowledge that methamphetamine exacerbates those problems and really has an effect 
on the heart. Baker acknowledged that asphyxia was a common cause of death in his line of work, and he had often diagnosed that. And yet, in this case, he doesn't diagnose asphyxia. He acknowledged he would normally see bruising in that kind of death, and there was no bruising here. He also acknowledged that he had certified fentanyl overdoses with levels much lower than Floyd's. And, and in what I think was, was probably the most powerful testimony the defense was able to elicit from Baker in the first time in a while that the defense is able to sort of get its mojo back, they get him to say, there's some hearsay in this case, and this is, we're going to talk about this in a second. So they get him to acknowledge that he had initially told the prosecutor's office that the level of fentanyl in Floyd's blood was a fatal level. And he told the prosecutors that in different circumstances, if he hadn't had the video, if, for instance, George Floyd had just been found dead at home, he would have certified the death as a fentanyl overdose. A couple interesting things about this. Number one, obviously, that's good for the defense. Now, there was a hearsay objection made to this because this is a statement made by this person outside of court for the truth of the matter asserted, right? So the defense wants this to come in to show that this doctor believed that fentanyl was a fatal level that in other circumstances would have been the cause of death. And even though, and this is an interesting thing about hearsay, even though the person testifying is the person who said that, it's still hearsay. It's still hearsay. So there's an objection. And the judge sustains that objection to the extent it goes to the truth of the matter asserted. But he allows it as impeachment. So what that means is the fact that he had told the prosecutors before this other thing, and now he's on the stand saying, no, it was a heart attack. This was all because of the neck restraint. That's why George Floyd died. The jury is supposed to consider that only for whether or not they believe Baker or whether or not they think Baker has changed his testimony. They're not supposed to consider it in deciding whether or not fentanyl killed George Floyd. And this is one of those things where you have a rule of evidence that is simply incompatible with the way people are. There is no human being who can compartmentalize testimony like that and only consider it for whether or not Baker's credible and not consider it for his medical judgment that fentanyl may have killed George Floyd. Right. And the defense here wins the objection, essentially, because they get the testimony in. That's all they care about. They know there's going to be an instruction to the jury, you know, only consider this for impeachment purposes. But it doesn't matter. The words are said. You can't unring that bell. They have just heard that Dr. Baker initially thought this was a fentanyl overdose. And that's, like you said, it's really hard to compartmentalize as a human being hearing those, hearing that type of testimony. Week three started with a request to sequester the jury as a result of an officer-involved shooting in Minnesota. And the reason they asked to sequester the jury, this is, in some extreme cases, you put them basically in hotel rooms, you limit their access to TV, to newspaper, to social media, to their phones, in order to isolate them from the outside world. And this is because as many of you probably know, there was an officer-involved shooting in Minnesota, at, I think blocks from where George Floyd died. And it was a, it, it hit news immediately because it was in the midst of the George Floyd trial. And you can imagine that the defense would want that, want this information to be kept from the jury because it could greatly affect how they feel about this case. Um, they may merge the two in their minds. Um, there's probably a lot of discussion in the media about all the politics surrounding an officer shooting. These are arguments that the defense makes, but the court rejected that claim. I think it would be foolish to think that doesn't have some impact on what the jury is hearing now. And look, judges never want to sequester juries. They just don't want to do it. They don't like to lock them up away from their family. And the judge had denied a sequester motion at the beginning. He's already told them, don't watch the news. Don't pay attention to the news. 
And he basically tells the defense, look, we're just, we're not going to do that. We're not going to lock them up. Sorry. I'll reiterate, they shouldn't pay attention to the news, but this is a completely separate incident. It has nothing to do with this case. Again, one of those things where the instruction is given, but that falls sh- far short of what the defense was hoping for. So that's how week three started with the denial of that request for to sequester the jury. Now, the first witness for the prosecution in week three is Dr. Jonathan Rich. Rich is a cardiologist who the prosecution called to further the state's case that Floyd died of lack of oxygen. Rich was not compensated for his research and report and was paid $1,200 a day to testify. Rich stated that Floyd died due to low oxygen as a result of the restraint he was put under. Rich testified that to the extent this was a heart event, it was a secondary aspect of the case. He also testified that Floyd did not die of a drug overdose. Rich's testimony mirrored that of Dr. Tobin in week two. Rich testified that ordinarily, a heart attack would result in a sudden deterioration of a person. They are fine, and then they are out. This event was one that occurred over time, which is more consistent with what one would expect to see when a heart event results from a lack of oxygen. The doctor testified that the officers commented on Floyd losing consciousness. If they had acted then, Floyd's life could have been saved merely by turning him on his side. One of the officers actually asked if he could be turned on his side, but Chauvin said no, just leave him. The doctor also testified that if the officers had applied CPR when Floyd's pulse stopped, Floyd could have been saved. For every minute after a pulse stops, the chance of resuscitation decreases by 10 to 15 percent. Rich testified that without the restraint, he would have survived. So this testimony, I think, is really, really, really important. In some ways, it seems like it mirrors what Tobin said, and it does. But remember sort of what the prosecution's doing here. They're trying to prove that Chauvin is guilty of something. After Tobin's testimony, you know, you feel pretty confident that that Chauvin's actions killed George Floyd. I mean, it's a it is a powerful testimony. Does it mean that Chauvin is guilty? But it's one of those things where, you know, I don't know Derek Chauvin. I don't know what he's thinking. I don't know what he believes happened in this case. But I just kept thinking as I was listening to Tobin's testimony, is Chauvin sitting there thinking, oh, my goodness, I killed this guy? Because it was so powerful in the way that Tobin was laying this out. But that's only one aspect. And I want to go all the way back to the first thing we talked about in this case, which are the charges. And... You know, there's that second degree murder charge, and I just, I really haven't seen a lot from the prosecution trying to prove that. But then you have second degree manslaughter, and you have third degree murder. And second degree manslaughter, just to remind you of the elements, whoever by their culpable negligence creates an unreasonable risk and consciously takes the chance of causing death a great bodily harm to another. And the basis for that charge is essentially... Derek Chauvin knew that putting someone in the prone position in this kind of circumstance, he knew this through his training, risked a a situation where they could not breathe and they would die of lack of oxygen. He ignored that training. He did it anyway, and, and George Floyd died. I mean, that's essentially probably what you need to prove to meet that. Third degree murder, which carries a maximum of 25 years in prison. Remember, manslaughter only carries a 10-year maximum in prison. Third degree murder, whoever without intent to affect the death of any person, causes the death of another by perpetrating an act imminently dangerous to others and evincing a depraved mind without regard for human life. That's what you have to show for third-degree murder. This testimony here, where the doctor says that there were opportunities to save George Floyd's life and that Chauvin was aware of those opportunities and decided, consciously decided, not to act. I feel like this testimony is really going towards that third degree murder charge and is the first thing where I've really seen the prosecution trying to prove that higher level 
of murder beyond just negligence. Right. And on cross-examination, the defense brought out that Floyd had one artery that was 90% blocked and that meth constricted the vessels further. We've already heard this a few times in other uh, cross-examinations of witnesses. At one point, the defense asked if Floyd had gotten into the squad car that day, would he have survived? The witness answered that if he weren't put in the restraint he was put in, he would have survived. The defense followed up by saying, so in other words, if he'd gotten into the squad car, he would have survived. In this way, it seems like the defense is making some sort of contributory negligence argument uh, with respect to Floyd and his actions of not getting into the squad car. But that actually doesn't work with their theory. If the defense is correct, then presumably Floyd would have died if he'd simply gotten into the back of the police car. Yeah, that was a weird part of this testimony because the defense keeps hammering on this. It's something the defense hasn't said up to this point, but it's something you've obviously heard people say. You know, if Floyd had never resisted, he wouldn't have died. If Floyd had just done what he was told, he wouldn't have died. And that's an argument. It's not a very effective argument, particularly with the charges that Derek Chauvin faces. But it's something the defense is suddenly pulling out at this point. But the problem is, I don't see how that's consistent. Their argument, I think, needs to be that Floyd, because of his drug use and because he had just eaten those drugs, remember what we talked about yesterday? I ate too many drugs. That he essentially was in the midst of an overdose. And that because of that, it really wasn't what Chauvin did that killed him. It was the fentanyl that killed him. But then all of a sudden, they're listing this testimony that if he'd just gotten into the back of the squad car, he'd been fine. To me, that just reinforces the idea that if Derek Chauvin hadn't done what he did, Floyd would still be alive. Yeah, I thought this was a bit of a misstep. So following this testimony, something interesting happens that you just don't see very often in trials. George Floyd's brother testifies. Now, in most jurisdictions, the family is not allowed to testify about the victim during the guilt phase. You can imagine it's very prejudicial to the jury to hear about the family and how much they love the victim and how wonderful the victim was. And it really doesn't have anything to do with whether or not the person who's been charged committed a murder. But in Minnesota, the Supreme Court of that state has recognized a doctrine they call the Spark of Life Doctrine. And it says that the prosecution may establish that the victim is more than just, quote, flesh and bone, but someone with the spark of life within them. The testimony doesn't have much to do with the case, but it was emotional the defense wisely asked no questions. They, there was no reason to cross-examine this witness. The, the scope of this testimony is fairly limited. The prosecution is not allowed to do a whole lot, but they are allowed to put this person on to really just show that George Floyd is more, he's more than just a hashtag. He's more than just the victim. He, is, he was a real person with the spark of life inside of them. So that was an interesting little moment that you just don't see and sort of goes to the fact that in this country, we have 50 states and every one of them has different rules and different laws. And that's why, you know, if you want to go practice law in Washington, you have to have a bar license in Washington. You can't just show up with your license from Florida and, and go ahead and practice. There are all these different rules you have to learn. So following this testimony, Seth Stoughton, who is a law professor from South Carolina, testifies and Staunton is a use of force expert. So he is somebody who, who knows what he's talking about when it comes to use of force. This will be the last expert for the prosecution. This is the guy who's going to wrap up their entire case. Now, the great thing about Staunton is the guy who's going to wrap everything up is he's going to be talking about use of force and what's appropriate use of force. And in doing that, he is going to watch the videos, talk about the videos for the jury, which means this trial started with the videos. It's going to end with the videos in a different way. At first, we just watched them to see what happened. Now we're going to see what happened with an expert telling us why what we're seeing is wrong. This is a law professor. He is someone who knows what he's talking about when it comes to the Supreme Court, and he walks through those factors uh, 
a Graham v. Collins or Collins v. Graham that we talked about last week. He reviews the evidence and he makes a determination that the force applied by Chauvin was excessive. Now, he goes through a pretty detailed analysis of the restraint used by Chauvin and why it was excessive given the circumstances of the arrest. Now, remember, there's a few things going on here when we talk about these factors. One question you ask is the seriousness of the offense. Remember, this is a $20 counterfeiting. And that's the first question the Supreme Court asks in this in this Graham case, is how serious is the offense? It's a $20 counterfeiting case. Not very serious, right? The second thing is the amount of resistance that's being applied and whether or not that resistance changes uh, as you're sort of walking through this. Among other things, Stoughton is able to note that two different times, one of the officers suggests rolling Floyd onto his side. And in both cases, Chauvin said no. This goes back to what we said earlier. There was another officer on the scene, another reasonable officer, we presume, who recognized there was a problem here and asked, should we roll him over? That was something they were trained to do. Chauvin says no both times. Stoughton also testifies that everyone in policing knows that putting someone in the prone position where Floyd was can lead to positional positional asphyxia. And he testifies that this is something people have known for decades, and this has been part of standard police training for decades, training which Chauvin had received. And in fact, he had received hundreds of hours of training that included this. Stoughton's testimony was also valuable because as we said, it allowed the prosecution to play all that video again and allowed the jury to see it. So in that way, the prosecution is coming full circle here, ending where they began. Now on cross, the defense made many of the same points that it made before. A review of force can't be based on 2020 hindsight. Every interaction is different. That the crowd was hostile and growing more so that Floyd has struggled with three different officers who couldn't overcome him. Basically pointing out that everything Chauvin did was reasonable given the situation that police officers face all the time, that he's not different than other police officers. And after a brief redirect, the prosecution rests at the beginning of week three of trial. So yeah, that's the end of the prosecution's case in chief. So the prosecution has now, in their mind, met the elements of at least one of these charges and proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Chauvin's guilty. The defense is going to put on its case. We're going to deal with that next week. But you already know, you know now what the defense is going to say. They're going to put on some experts and some witnesses. and, And I will tell you, having already seen some of this, some of these are pretty good witnesses and maybe the defense makes headway. But at the end of the prosecution's case, I will say the prosecution made a very, very strong case, a very compelling case to me. I'm keeping my mind open. I want to hear all, I want to hear all the testimony, but I will say, number one, that my initial criticism of the prosecution's case, that they were going with asphyxia as opposed to a heart attack, I was wrong about that. They were right. And I think they've proven that. The question still remains, was this reasonable on the part of Chauvin? I do think the defense is in a pretty big hole when it comes to showing that something else caused Floyd's death. And it's possible that that line of questioning about how if Floyd had just gotten in the back of the car, would he still be alive today, was a tacit admission that they were no longer going to be able to show that something else killed Floyd. Maybe there will be people who still believe something else killed Floyd, killed Floyd but the prosecution's done a really good job of proving that Floyd died because of the position he was put in that day by Chauvin. Now the question's going to be, was that reasonable? Was it in reaction to what Floyd was doing? Was it a reasonable use of force? The defense is going to talk about that a lot in, in the rest of week three. And like I said, we'll, we'll move on to that next week. Alice, do you have anything else you want to say before you wrap up this week of testimony? 
No, but that was chocked full. And you guys have a lot, a lot to comment on, I know. So let us know your thoughts. These have been some really thick episodes. I hope you guys are enjoying them and not bored out of your mind. Obviously, we're packing a lot of testimony into an hour or so of recording. We've left some stuff out. I'm sure you have questions. You guys have had great questions up to this point. Let us know, prosecutorspod at gmail.com. Email us. Hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, at Prosecutors Pod. Find us on Reddit. We're all over the place. You can find us anywhere. Uh, let us know what you think. Keep leaving those reviews. Thank you so much for that. Just want to remind you, we are going to be at CrimeCon this year, first week in June. If you want to join us in CrimeCon and you don't have your tickets already, go out and get those tickets and use the promo code PROSECUTORS for a 10% discount on those. Now, we didn't mention them today, but I do want to just give a shout out to our sponsors for this week, Pretty Litter, Daily Harvest, and BetterHelp. Support those guys. They support us. We'd love to have you support them. This trial is coming to an end. The defense is going to wrap up its case, and then we're going to have closing arguments, and then it's going to be in the jury's hands. So it is possible that by the next time you hear from us, this case may be over and we may have a verdict. We will talk more about that next time when we join you. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutor. excited. Is there going to be a lot of motions practice before the defense starts or have they already started? Wow. I thought there'd be a directed verdict or something. That That's strange because you would think a directed verdict would be like a day-long argument, you know? Can we just talk about this hilarious Insta- I don't understand this Instagram of pod- prosecutors memes. This is the funniest thing I've ever seen. I can't believe someone did this. <laughs> that's hilarious. I think they might run out of material soon.